Um, so my sincere thanks to uh, all the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. It's, uh, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to do so. Um, as a prefatory note, um, I do want to say that this paper is, at least as its point of origin, uh, conditioned by uncertainty as well as a tactile sensory experience. To try and explain what I mean by that, um, my uncertainty hinges on the knowledge, or at least the assumption, that I think I'm the youngest contributor speaking here today. Consequently, I speak without a first-hand connection to Eric Mottram as a person, um, and without a first-hand recollection of the specific periods of British poetry in which he played a key role. The reason for that is very simple. When Mottram passed away in 1995, I was 10 years old and I lived in rural Finland between a wheat field and a pig farm, um, which meant that matters that I occupy a lot of my thinking and a lot of my time these days were, back then in the mid-1990s, something very much in a different language, from a different decade, in a different country. So that's the uncertainty. But when I say uncertainty, I also hopefully uh, speak of possibility of potential ways through which I might somehow try and orient myself as a part of the discussions and the, and the talks today. And I say that because despite this generational and geographical uh, divergence that I just described, my uncertainty is nevertheless accompanied by a memory of a certain tactile sensory experience. What I do know about Mottram today, I learned in the archive. So between 2008 and 2012, I worked on my PhD thesis, which then eventually became that book that Clive mentioned in the introduction, published by Balgrave Macmillan uh, towards the end of last year. And that book contains that uh, chapter on a late 70s Mottram piece, Pollock Record, the performed version of which, as Mottram described in an interview with Peter John Skelt, was based around big sheets with materials on them from which the participating uh, performers would read one selection, one after another, until one of them reread one of the sections that had already been uttered and the performance came to a conclusion. The primary research for a large part of that chapter was largely carried out amongst the Mottram papers right here at King's. And my most lasting memory of that time when I was reading them um, was my first kind of encounter with those aforementioned sheets that were used in the Pollock record performance. I remember those sheets as physically challenging objects. I remember that each individual sheet uh, actually consisted of two sort of sheets taped together and they measured about 35 inches in height and about 25 inches uh, in, in width. So that's about 89 centimeters or 64 centimeters in terms of the dimensions in the metric system. Um, I remember that the textual materials of Pollock record were not written on the sheets directly, but they were instead glued onto them. Um, and I remember that the length of each textual fragment or section varied. Some were comprised of several stanzas, whereas others featured only a single line. I remember that in places where the tape connecting the two halves of each sheet had obscured a particular fragment of text, Mottram had rewritten the obscured words by hand in order to ensure their visibility. I remember that each individual section was bordered by lines drawn with a thick black marker, and the sheets did not include a great deal of blank space as a result. So as a consequence, when I unfolded one of the sheets on, the on a table, it covered such a, um, and, and spread over such a wide expanse of material that reading it became a disorienting and vertiginous experience. Even on a kind of a purely visual level, it felt to me at the time that it was almost impossible for me to focus on the whole range of text um, on a kind of a single scan. And that was only kind of uh, enforced further by the indeterminate order of the text themselves. And at first, I only felt like I could observe each of these textual fragments individually, one at a time. So the memory of that experience, of that archival encounter, of that vertiginous reading, and of a kind of a process that develops one fragment at a time, is also, I think, the kind of orientation I hope to follow in, in this talk today.
And that's just a metaphorical way of saying that what will follow is meandering. So what might it um, mean to encounter a poet like Mottram or a project like Pollock Record within the archive? Um, reflecting on her own indebtedness to archives, the American poet Susan Howe describes them as places where, quote, words and objects come into their own and have their space again. That is, for how archives are spaces where one can experience the enduring relations and connections between what was and what is, and where the, quote, pre-articulate empty theater of manuscripts and objects can allow thoughts to surprise themselves at the instant of seeing, and where the, quote, portrait of history may be captured in insignificant verbal textualities, textiles, and material details. Howe's descriptions of the archive appear to hinge upon a series of simultaneities, ambiguities, and perhaps even paradoxes. Most evidently, her statements position the archive as a place where the past, the what was, and the present, the what is, can coexist within the same space. But they also toward, like, gesture towards um, additional formulations that share a comparable set of ambiguities and tensions. For instance, the notion that archival objects and manuscripts are, in Howe's words, an empty theater that nevertheless facilitate an instant of seeing seems to kind of evoke some kind of an interplay between absence and presence. What might one actually see within an empty theater? What can we, in fact, articulate through the pre-articulate. Howe's reference to the portrait of history could also suggest a certain recursive quality. If we understand portrait as a kind of a, a constructed representation, it might then stand to reason that analyses drawn from a portrait of history would involve representations of representations, possibly. If we interpret Howe's statements in this manner, and I admit that there are other ways we could read them, her reflections appear to share some commonalities with Arlette Farge's historiographical study, The Allure of Archives. Like Howe's intermingling of what was and what is, as well as her empty theater that facilitates an instant of seeing, Farge regards archival documents as a tear in the fabric of time, an unplanned glimpse offered into an unexpected event where things are laid bare and one can on, not only find the inaccessible, but also the living. But at the same time, when she says all this, Farge also insists that the archive is not compiled with a view toward history, nor does it necessarily tell the truth, according to Farge. She in instead posits that archival documents are elements of reality that produce meaning by their appearance in a given historical time. Varge therefore situates the study of archival documents as an intellectual labor that is centered on the conditions of the document's appearance, in which this appearance must be deciphered in order to tame a piece of past time. And from that deciphering, one can dr then draw out themes and formulate broader interpretations. So that would be Farge's account. So in other words, Farge, perhaps not entirely similarly to how, associates archives with certain senses of simultaneities, ambiguities, and somehow paradoxes. Whilst how it mixes past and present, or absence and presence, depending on how we read it, Farge alludes to a temporal rupture that excesses the inaccessible. Whilst Howe refers to a seemingly representational portrait of history, Farge positions archival study as a decryption of appearances. In both cases, the archive is somehow conceptualized as a site of some considerable tensions. If we were that way inclined, and we don't have to be, uh, perhaps these tensions in Howe's and Farge's respective writings could be examined further via Derrida's slightly unusual and quasi-psychoanalytic reading of the archive in Archive Fever. Effectively, Derrida regards the archive as a negotiation between the Freudian concepts of Thanatos and Eros, i.e. the death drive and the pleasure principle. 
The latter is in this case associated with a drive towards conservation and archiving, which Derrida sees as an affirmation of the past, present, and future. The former is, on the other hand, connected to a form of archive destroying. That is, Derrida's archival death drive refers to an incitement of forgetfulness, to amnesia and the annihilation of memory, as well as the eradication of the archive, the documentary, or the monumental apparatus. From this perspective, then, the tensions that, that we find in Howe and Farge can perhaps be read into Derrida's Freudian negotiation between Thanatos and Eros. That is, perhaps these tensions between absence and presence, access and inaccessibility, history and appearance, and so on and so on, all involve some form of an anxiety about memory and forgetting. But what bearing might these um, theoretical formulations have on my own archival encounter with Mottram's archive, and especially those sheets for Pollock record? One of the sections on those sheets contains the lines Memories arrested in space, a gesture I shall never forget. As it is often the case in Mottram's poetry, the lines are sourced from found material. The first is lifted from a statement by Jackson Pollock in which the painter describes his technique. The second is a detail from a Henry James's um, early short story, The Madonna of the Future. On first reading, Mottram's juxtaposition seemingly depicts Pollock's paintings as a record of his physical movements insofar as they trace his gestures over an empty canvas. That is, a kind of a first-hand ekphrastic analysis of the two lines is likely to yield notions that are not entirely dissimilar from Harold Rosenberg's argument that abstract expressionists saw their canvas as an arena in which to act and that their paintings are not pictures, but events. And I follow a lot of those thoughts in, in that aforementioned chapter. But if I think about those lines today in relation to archives, to memory, and to forgetting, um, alternative nodes and pathways also seem possible to me when looking at those two lines. And I'll now try and follow some of those thoughts. A gesture I shall never forget. In James's story, the narrator meets Theobald, who is an American expatriate artist living in Florence. We learn that Theobald has spent several years working on his masterpiece, which would be a new version of Raphael's Madonna of the Chair. Yet when the narrator finally sees Theobald's painting towards the end of the story, he discovers that it is only a blank canvas, cracked and discolored by time. The second line in Mottram is taken immediately, um, after this, in, immediately in a scene that occurs immediately after that key revelation towards the end of the story. Theobald, reflecting upon his inability to transfer his artistic vision to his practice at his easel, um, raises his hand towards this blank canvas and thus makes the gesture that the narrator of James's story will never forget. And that's the sentence that Mottram borrows for his poem. So Mottram's quotation from James therefore carries its own set of complexities and paradoxes. Although the narrator may never forget the gesture, that gesture is effectively made towards blankness. The narrator's recollection can only pertain to the gesture and not the painting, since in the case of James's story, there is no actual painting to remember. In other words, then, Mottram's line of never forgetting could equally gesture towards some kind of an absence, a painting that is not there. Like the aforementioned tensions I tried to tease out from Howe, Farge, and Derrida, the line from Pollock record, at least in its Jamesian context, is also entangled with notions of absence and presence and access and inaccessibility and so on and so on. But what about the preceding line? memories arrested in space. If the gesture that cannot be forgotten points towards an empty canvas, it is tempting to read the preceding line with its connection to Pollock's works, which would be difficult to describe as empty canvases, that indeed they are frequently anything but, um, as a kind of a counterforce to the complexities and paradoxes we find within a gesture I shall never forget. In that preceding line, memories are seemingly preserved in some kind of a spatial arrangement and presumably rendered somehow visible. 
But the verb matram, via Pollock's original quotation, chose as the description of this preservation is also maybe somewhat uncomfortable. While it is undoubtedly not used in that context, it is nevertheless quite difficult to read arrested without thinking about that word's links to incarceration and police violence. On this reading, then, the memories are not so much preserved as they are removed and detained, and that detention is, potentially, enacted via some system of governance. In archaeology of knowledge, Foucault may have theorized that the archive is a system of discursivity that establishes the possibility of what can be said, but he also described it as a, quote, the law of what can be said, the system that governs the appearance of statements as unique events. Read in conjunction with that line from Pollock record, Foucault's phrasing is potentially troubling for this reading of the lines that I'm trying to pursue. If we take memories arrested in space as a counterforce to the subsequent line, but those memories are apprehended by a similar law of what can be said, could such a system of governance be interpreted as a counterforce to the entanglements that we find in a gesture I shall never forget? Now, that's a long question, and I ask these uh, questions in part because of the predicaments that occurred to me during my own encounter with Pollock Record in the archive. Whichever version of the project I examined, whether it was the archived sheets or some of its subsequent publications, um, Mottram's insistence that the piece was designed as a performance text reminded me that the materials for Pollock Record were in some ways performance documentation. But as Philip Auslander has noted, performance art has often considered performance and documentation from an ontological perspective, whereby the performance event is seen as a, um, the preceding act that both uh, authored and authorized the subsequent document. However, without a recorded performance, the archival materials of Mottram's project the sheets that were used in a performance, potentially skew this ontological framework that Auslander suggests. Like Theobald at the end of James's story, the archived sheets make a gesture towards a performance event, but that event itself is not effectively recorded. At the same time, access to a recorded performance of Pollock record might be equally limiting. It would likely restrict our understanding of the piece, which Mottram in his own words designed as a container that would not contain too rigidly, to an isolated performance and thereby subjected to some kind of rigid system that governs its appearance as a unique event. In sum, my predicament that I encountered was this. Was Pollock record itself caught between memories arrested in space and a gesture I shall never forget? Um, the broader ramifications of that predicament can be seen in some of Peggy Phelan's arguments where she posits that the only life of any performance is in the present, that it cannot participate in the circulation of representation of representations as a form of documentation without, in that process, becoming something other than a performance. Alternative positions, such as those held by Barbara Clausen, instead suggest that it is not necessary to designate performance documentation as an otherness that betrays the integrity of the event, since these artifacts can still be utilized as tools that subject the apparently non-graspable to new methods of interpretation and analysis. I tried to work my way through those debates during the course of writing my own studies about Pollock record and other performances during the British Poetry Revival. As such, perhaps further unpicking of the specific complexities of these particular predicaments might not be the most productive course of action at this present moment. Rather, I wanted to allude to having experienced those predicaments because I wonder if the tension I read into the aforementioned lines in Pollock record, that tension between memories arrested in space and a gesture I shall never forget, might also appear elsewhere. For instance, in his introduction to the 1996 anthology, Conductors of Chaos, Ian Sinclair describes the British poetry revival as a, quote, off-piste, unnoticed episode. 
which he saw at least at the time as inhabiting a state of exile within ephemeral pamphlets and chapbooks that were difficult to locate without a team of private detectives, as Sinclair describes it. In a sense, maybe Sinclair's sentiments contain their own gesture I shall never forget. Let me try and explain what I mean by that. Um, like Theobald at the end of James's story, Sinclair's statement gestures towards something. In this case, the British Poetry Revival and the pamphlets and chapbooks that were published during this uh, period. But that statement also suggests that the gesture in question actually points towards something that cannot be seen a state of exile, or publications that are unavailable or difficult to find. But at the same time, any statement of this nature that Sinclair makes, any statement that refers to the unavailability of particular works in an introduction to an anthology that contains some of those self-same works, is inevitably a performative one. That is, while the statement might gesture towards something it claims cannot be seen, the anthology pages that follow, at least to one extent or another, render that something somewhat more visible. In other words, while Sinclair's introductory statements might be possible to frame as Theobald's gesture I shall never forget, the anthology instead might present us with um, a set of memories arrested in space. Um, perhaps another example of this might be Robert Shepard's epilogue to When Bad Times Made for Good Poetry, where he expressed concerns about how, at least in 2007, when Shepard originally wrote the essay, um, contemporary scenes of British poetry were seemingly reluctant to embrace their own histories in Shepard's view. Shepard considered that this was because of this tendency to look the other way, that episodes in the history of British poetry, such as the English Intelligencer or the Albert Hall Poetry Reading, were in 2007 yet to be pegged into history, as Shepard puts it. Specifically, Shepard argued that this pegging into history required neither willfully ignoring such episodes nor turning them into mythology, but acknowledging their specificity and evaluating it. In other words, the tendency that troubled Shepard in his essay, that is, this tendency to look the other way, is perhaps another gesture that is comparable to that of Theobald, where one points towards something that is not easily or eventually available to view. In contrast, then, Shepard's pegging into history, that is, a rig rigorous and specific acknowledgement and evaluation of the British poetry revival, could, in the framework of his essay, be understood as something like an act of arresting memories in space. But in thinking through those observations in that manner, as I have just done, I still seem to position those two lines from Pollock record, memories arrested in space and a gesture I shall never forget as counterforces of one another. Even though I previously, just a few moments ago, worried about the role of the word arrest within them. So if I have any hope to conclude this paper today at all, um, perhaps those worries need to be resolved somewhat more decisively than my earlier efforts did. So towards the end of, um, on the concept of history, Walter Benjamin writes, and I quote, thinking involves not only the movement of thoughts, but their arrest as well. The arrest in this instance is clearly separate from the laws and systems of governments that appear in Foucault's aforementioned descriptions. Instead, arrest, as it appears in, in Benjamin, uh, signifies something closer to the word in the original German text, stillstellung, or still position. As Benjamin explains, quote, where thinking suddenly comes to a stop in a constellation saturated with tensions, it gives that constellation a shock by which thinking is crystallized as a monad. A constructive materialist historiography would, according to Benjamin's essay, approach a historical object when it could be approached as precisely this kind of a monad, which could be recognized as a, quote, sign of a messianic arrest of happening. So to be clear, um, Benjamin is specifically thinking about revolutionary chances in the history of oppressed, and his context for his ideas is therefore vastly different from how I am thinking about them today. Um, but perhaps something can still be borrowed from the aforementioned use that we find in Benjamin, that use of the word arrest, which could in turn be uh, read into that line I've been troubling myself over in Mottram's poem. Um, 
Consider from this perspective, perhaps the memories arrested in space signify some kind of a monadic crystallization. If this understanding of the, in, in this particular understanding of arrest in that line, the memories mentioned there are rendered into something intelligible, something that can be read. Moreover, it might logically follow that any analysis or elaborations drawn from such readings would present further arrests of this nature, that is, moments where something is crystallized and the possibility of understanding might be presented. Admittedly, the line still leaves the exact content of the memories somewhat more ambiguous. But if the overall dynamic of the line is understood as an arrest that reveals the possibility of a monadic crystallization, it may indeed be possible to read memories arrested in space as a counterforce to the notions of absence and presence or access and inaccessibility, which I troubled myself over and over again with my earlier explorations of a gesture I shall never forget. Instead of a gesture towards a blank canvas or pointing towards something that cannot be permitted into view or negotiating anxieties of memory and forgetting, memories arrested in space on this reading signifies some kind of a still position. Since the memories themselves remain unnamed, the crystallization in this instance may still be only partial or unfinished or uncertain, but nevertheless, the counterforce of the line hinges on the possibility of grasping the world without gripping it. I am personally drawn to understand the dynamic of these two lines in this manner, because that reading, however obliquely, um, speaks towards the nodes and pathways and simultaneities that I remember from my own archival encounter with Mottram's work. Coincidentally, Around the same time I was spending at least one day a week traveling to London in order to consult the materials housed at King's, I also started attending London-based poetry readings and other events more regularly. Uh, first at places like um, Birkbeck or um, Jeff Hilson's uh, Crossing the Line, uh, and then increasingly farther afield whenever time and money afforded it. Um, something about those two coinciding events, the research in the archive and the encountering of readings in pubs and similar venues gave me the impression of coming across and entering into one constellation within my own contemporary moment while still uh, coming into and trying to grasp a very specific earlier one. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you.